overview of Arcadia's significance and then kind of give you a sneak peek of what our facilities are, hopefully to entice anyone that hasn't been in a long time. Uh, and then I'll kind of round it out with the current state of affairs with our site. How many people have been to Arcadia? Okay, so a few people that you'll learn a lot about it tonight. I did bring some information with our address and things like that. Um, so for kind of perspective of where we're located, we're over in Milton, uh, just off of Highway 90. You see here the blue area is the original land grant. Um, and we own just a very small portion of the site today and there's a little bit of property that we have acquired in recent years that you'll see a little bit later. Um, a little bit better perspective, we are close to where Avalon Boulevard comes out and Pensacola State College. Um, so we're really close to kind of the Pace Milton line. So Arcadia's historical significance actually starts um, at the very end of the second Spanish period. And a lot of people don't realize that um, because they focus so much on the milling part of it that happened later when we were in American territory. Uh, but Arcadia's history actually begins in 1817, uh, before the territorial <coughs> period. There was a gentleman named Juan de la Rua. Some of you guys might be familiar with that name. There are descendants who still live in Pensacola today. and. Driving around Pensacola, you'll see Rua Street or La Rua Street. It's named after this individual. Uh, he uh, came to Pensacola with his family, uh, fleeing an uprising in the Canary Islands, and uh, petitioned to the King of Spain to be given a land grant. And this was very common at this time period. A lot of colonists and settlers were petitioning for these land grants to be given to them. Um, particularly for industry um, and things like that. So he petitioned for this particular land grant. It was 800 arbens, which is a French measurement. It um, equates to about 680 acres. So this was a huge piece of property. And today we only own 42 acres, so a very small uh, snapshot, but we thankfully were able to save some of the most significant parts of that site. Um, so this is a earlier map depicting it, and it's really interesting. I always tell people with historic maps, whoever originally had the land grant, a lot of times their name will stick. So we see much later, along past Rua, his name still on this land grant because he basically originated this parcel. We think this is a portrait of him. We're not entirely sure if that is him or not. We don't know as very, uh, very much about him. Um, but he received the land grant in 1817. It doesn't appear that he actually built any mills or anything like that. We do know from some early documents that he began to quarry out ironstone, uh, which is sort of unique for this area because Florida does not have a lot of natural stone, like this type of stone, um, that grows um, naturally in Santa Rosa County and parts of Escambia. But there's a huge ironstone outcropping at Arcadia. You can still see parts of it today. So he quarried this out and sold it to make money and to build fortifications. Uh, we think even Fort Pickens might have uh, been built with some ironstone from Arcadia because it had a really amazing outcropping. We've got great documents about these scouting expeditions looking for this stone because everybody was wanting it for a building material. Um, but he quarried out the ironstone, but other than that, it seems like that's about all he did on site. He actually married into the Bonifay family, if anybody's familiar with that name. The Bonifays uh, were very involved in the brick making industry over in Pensacola. So he married into the Bonifay family and focused a lot more on the brick industry, but also Pensacola. So he was mayor at one point. He served in several other political offices. So he didn't really spend a whole lot of time at Arcadia from what we can tell. So in 1828, he sold it to a gentleman named Joseph Forsyth. Uh, school kids always think that's Abraham Lincoln, and then it just, <laughs> just tail spins from there. So we have that it's not Abraham Lincoln. Uh, but Joseph Forsyth was a northerner, which a lot of northerners were coming down from Connecticut, New Hampshire, um, kind of venturing out into the southern frontier of northwest Florida and lower Alabama. Um, so he 
was established as a businessman in Pensacola, um, but he purchased the land grant. And it's always amazing taking into perspective inflation. Can anybody guess what he paid for the 800 ARPA land grant? Just give me a guess. Bucks. Less than a thousand. Twenty-five bucks. A little more than that. Okay. Four hundred dollars. Oh my. So you get 680 acres for a whopping four hundred dollars. Mm -hmm. uh, but what we've sort of determined is that while he might have had the money to purchase that land grant, he probably didn't know a lot about milling. Just kind of a guess what we're assuming based on kind of what we know, what we don't know about him. Um, we think that Juan de la Rua set up that land grant very specifically for milling though. While he didn't do it, geographically, when you look at all the different resources that that parcel encompasses, it has everything you need to be the perfect place for water powered industry. So we think it was very intentional from the start, but it wasn't until Forsyth came along that the complex actually uh, took off. Very quickly after purchasing the property, he partnered with two brothers, Andrew and Ezekiel Simpson. Um, the Simpson name runs pretty deep in this area. Uh, they were actually from South Carolina and had come earlier, and their father had a sawmill uh, called Woodbine not far from Arcadia. So they had some milling knowledge, they had a little bit of capital, so together this company of Forsyth and Simpson had everything they needed to actually start a mill complex. What, what time, what, what year is this? So we know by 1830 they partnered. Okay. Okay. It's 1830. Um, we have no surviving photographs of the mill itself. We're very fortunate to have some photographs of the Simpson house that I'll talk about a little bit later. So we rely on artist renderings by Dave Edwards, who's done a lot of the local historical renderings for us and other organizations. Um, so you'll see a lot of these uh, images, but we know that by 1830s, they have built a two-story kind of open-air sawmill, um, and that was just the beginning. After that, pretty quickly, they continued to build different facilities. Around the same time as the partnership, they sold a quarter of the land grant to a gentleman named Timothy Twitchell. Kids always think that's a nice Disney character name. Uh, Timothy Twitchell had his own smaller mill complex on the northeast uh, quarter of the property, and he was a little bit more experimental in his industry. He had um, a bucket and pail factory where he was using cypress trees to make buckets. Um, he also experimented with the silk industry. Uh, there was talk of a silk boom happening, and you can actually find newspaper articles about it. And you can find uh, articles in the paper here where people are selling Chinese mulberry trees and exporting them, selling them. It was going to be this big thing. So he jumped onto that. He built a brick cocoonery, bought the trees, planted them, did everything. And very quickly, everyone realized this is the world's worst climate and environment <laughs> for silk. So that failed pretty bad. Um, so, but he did, he was more experimental. Um, in his operations. So as the complex grew, they also had to deal with transportation issues. Uh, Arcadia is about three miles from the Blackwater River, and that's the main shipping channel. So the lumber products, later when they had textiles, all of that's got to be transported three miles to get onto these larger ships. Um, so they tried a very rudimentary railroad that was not incredibly successful. It did move the product. Um, but nonetheless, it was still a struggle to get these products to the Blackwater River. Around the time that Arcadia's really starting to ramp up, Ezekiel Simpson built a large home on the bluff overlooking the mill complex. Um, we're lucky to have several photographs of this house at different points in its life. Um, this is one of the earlier photographs looking at the back face of the house. The front of the house overlooked the mill with the two-story porch. Uh, but Ezekiel Simpson built this home. We refer to it sometimes as a plantation house just in the most general sense, but he was not growing cotton here. He actually had a cotton um, uh, business up in lower Alabama, and that's probably where they were getting their cotton from. Um, but he built this home. Um, his first wife passed away of yellow fever along with uh, two of their children. Um, he ended up remarrying and all told he had 13 kids um, who ran around in this house. 
And I'll talk a little bit more about what happened to that house later, but this is a nice panoramic photo that we have. There were other outbuildings on the property besides just the house. We had an office here. You can see what was the barn off there. And then behind the house, hidden in this photograph, is actually a cabin that I've excavated archaeologically and we think might have been um, for an enslaved individual. We'll talk about it a little bit later. So with all these lumber products that they were um, working with, there was an early desire to have a cotton mill at Arcadia. And this was something that was happening all throughout the South. We refer to it as the cotton mill campaign. And the basic premise of this was Southerners were starting to question kind of their colonial status. They felt that they were growing this cotton then sending it up north. Northern mills were producing it in a close then selling it back at an inflated price. The Southerners began to not like this system, so the cotton mill campaign started to brew, and there's a lot of propaganda in the newspapers about we should build our own mills and uh, make our own clothes. Um, and so this was followed quite a bit in the media, which is good for us because then we can get these documents and understand it a little better. There were early efforts to have this cotton mill at Arcadia, but it actually did not get constructed until 1845. Um, another part of the cotton mill campaign that's interesting is it begins to open the conversation about skilled labor of the enslaved. Up until this point, the enslaved were thought to be inferior. They were put out in cotton fields that they weren't capable of skilled settings. And so putting an enslaved person in a mill meant that they were smart enough to be skilled. And that caused a lot of controversy and a lot of newspaper articles talking about this notion because it negated slavery. So because of that, Arcadia was covered quite a bit in the media all the way up into Boston. Um, we have newspaper articles following this controversy about putting uh, enslaved in a skilled setting. So in order to run this mill, up until this point, the enslaved population at Arcadia was mainly males working in the mills, cutting the trees down. There might have been a few females that would have had more domestic roles in the house or looking after children. But building this cotton mill changed the demographic at Arcadia. So we know that the owners went to Virginia and purchased 40 female slaves um, to be the initial labor force. And the idea was that women and young girls had smaller, more delicate fingers, and they could manipulate the machinery better than a man with larger hands. So that was the reasoning for purchasing women. Um, and we have some great newspaper articles talking about the comparison. This one in particular basically says it's ridiculous to say that there's any difference between a white girl or a black girl in a factory. Because, you know, it's... Um, it basically negates slavery. It should not matter about the color of the fingers. So there's a lot of interesting media that we can pull from to understand this time period better. And it's interesting because we do see in the census records the changes in the population at Arcadia. Um, and it's amazing to watch it be mainly male-focused and then introduce this female population in 1845. And when they started doing census slave schedules, we start seeing children. So people are marrying and or procreating. And so the, the demographic changes into actual families, Arcadia, not just males or just women. So the cotton mill was never incredibly successful, particularly financially. Other individuals who were local bought into the company. Um, and there was a lot of infighting. People didn't want to pay their principal interest. Um, the cotton mill wasn't actually making a lot of money, so uh, it didn't actually operate terribly long, only about 10 years. In 1855, Joseph Forsythe passed away, and by this point, he had become a senator, was living in Tallahassee, so he wasn't really around for that end couple years of Arcadia, but Ezekiel Simpson was there with his family and looking after everything. Um, but Forsythe passed away, and then the textile mill burned mysteriously just three months later. Um, so we may never know. I don't know a lot about uh, antebellum insurance policies, but I would be willing to bet that it was arson, uh, but we may never know that for sure. 
So the textile mill burned to the ground and the remaining owners chose not to rebuild it to basically just shut down operations to Arcadia. Because by this time, steam power was available. So the good majority of their lumber facilities had moved to Baghdad. So the only thing left at Arcadia at this point, 1855, is just the textile mill, but also a rather large enslaved labor force that was associated with it. So they put it up for public auction, the entire thing in 1856, um, including the housing, the mills, everything, and nobody purchased it, um, which is a little surprising to me, um, but it gives it an interesting history of how it came to be today. Um, so nobody purchased the property, and so it stayed in the Simpson family until recent years. And I'll kind of walk you guys through that history. And a lot of times we've been guilty in the past of saying, and that's the end of Arcadia, but there was actually a lot of civil war action happening in Arcadia while it wasn't operating, because most people by the height of the civil war have fled this area anyway. Um, but we do have some great documents about troop movements coming through Arcadia. We know they burned one of the bridges over Pond Creek. We also know that um, some Confederate soldiers used the Simpson House as an outpost, and we have a really great account of a small skirmish that happened uh, when the Union found out and traveled overnight to surprise attack them. So we've got some really great documents about kind of the Civil War period. Um, and after that, the history kind of lulls a little bit. You have Reconstruction um, and people kind of moving forward and rebuilding after the Civil War. When we get into the turn of the century, into the 1900s, 19-teens, um, we know that Simpson House is still standing and it's being run as Arcadia Farm. By this point, Ezekiel Simpson has passed, and it's his son and his wife and children who are living at kind of the homestead, looking after things and running a farm. And we've got a few accounts of this farm. We know that they were producing um, some of the subsistence for the um, San Carlos Hotel and places like that. Um, so they were doing business with the larger enterprises in Pensacola. And then we lose track of time a little bit and you kind of fast forward a little bit until Warren Weeks. Does anybody know that name, Warren Weeks? I know you did. Um, in the 1960s, a gentleman named Warren Weeks started learning about mills in the area, and he got really interested in it, and he wanted to find Arcadia. He had read something about it, knew there was this huge mill complex. So the story, the legend has it, that he got in a canoe with his daughter and floated down Pond Creek trying to see if he could find it, and he found the dam and realized he had found something and started researching it more and figured out that he had found Arcadia. Um, and I always like to remind people, it was never lost. <laughs> The Simpson family, among plenty of other people, knew it was there. It was like one of the very popular swimming holes of the time. Um, but there wasn't a lot of attention on it from a preservation standpoint or trying to interpret it for the public. So that's what Warren really did, was generate public awareness of this amazing site. So he, I mean, single-handedly made it into a place that Boy Scout groups and school groups could come and see. It was rudimentary, but he did this on his own. Um, and if you've been to Arcadia, you know we live, we, we live, we're in a neighborhood. We were there first. But there's a neighborhood, a modern neighborhood, and the Arcadia property was meant to be a part of that neighborhood. Um, but fortunately, because of Warren and other people, um, especially the Santa Rosa Historical Society, they um, got a grant from the state to purchase the original 34 acres to save it from residential development. Um, so we owe a lot um, to the Santa Rosa Historical Society. And in 2004, they um, decided to donate it to the University of West Florida, who could be continual stewards and preserve it and give it the resources that it needed to flourish. Um, and with that, it's owned by UWF, and there's a management agreement with the UWF Historic Trust to manage the property, and they're the same people that manage the Wentworth Museum and that whole complex in downtown Pensacola. Unfortunately, Hurricane Ivan really caused some damage. That should say 2004. Um, we all know that date. <laughs> um, there was a lot of damage. You can still see it today. There's a lot of downed trees that we just work around. 
Uh, so it wasn't until 2007 that it opened to the public under the auspices of UWF. And since then, we have been working very diligently to create a destination and to develop it, expand it, make it as robust as we can. Um, so this is just a map to kind of give you the lay of the land. This is where the Arcadia Homestead is. I'll talk about in a moment, so it's up in the neighborhood. Um, down here, we're pretty much at the end on a cul-de-sac is our museum. And then we've got a boardwalk system that takes you all around the remains of the mills. We don't have any standing structures except for the secondary Simpson house that I'll tell you about in a moment. Um, so a lot of times you have to use your imagination, but we have interpretive signage throughout to kind of explain what the site is like. So just to kind of give you a picture of um, what things are like, we have a really nice boardwalk system with the somewhat new ADA compliant bridge that we built a few years ago. We used to have an old swing bridge and people still ask me about it. I always have to say, I mean, it was a liability and a wheelchair could not go over it. And we wanted, we strive for accessibility. So um, that was important. We also have a series of nature trails and then we have an outdoor pavilion with working replicas of the mill technology. Warren Weeks uh, had a caretaker house built in 1990 and we've been very fortunate to be able to renovate that facility into more of a professional museum um, versus the house that it was created to be. So we're very lucky to have a museum um, with a pretty extensive exhibit, a classroom space for meetings, lectures, programs, things like that. Um, so that's kind of home base for us. We uh, started participating in the UWF Archaeological Field School program. Uh, that's something that I helped start when I was actually still a grad student in 2009. Uh, I wanted to write my master's thesis about Arcadia, so I did uh, the field work to kind of start us into this program. And we've excavated all over the site. We've been able to determine that enslaved people were living to the north of the mill complex. Um, we have excavated the intact brick basement of the original Simpson house and found a lot of beautiful artifacts to survive. This is on display in our museum. So we have a program of archeology span going on. We also have graduate students who are doing their theses on Arcadia. We have educational programming. We do a lot of field trips. Um, fourth grade, students learn about local history, and that's our niche, but we also have um, science-related lessons and history, archeology, span things as well. We do seasonal programming. Um, we're always trying to expand upon that, but we've got a Civil War tour usually in the fall, and then we do a floor tour in the spring where we talk about the use of plants with Native Americans and earlier settlers and things like that. And this is just to give you perspective. Down here is the mill site, and then up here is Arcadia Homestead that we only opened this past March. So it's still relatively new. It has not been open very long. We were very fortunate for the Simpson family to donate this parcel to us to interpret for the public. Um, the original Simpson house stood for 100 years, but unfortunately, like most buildings of that time period, it burned to the ground in 1935. Um, but they built another house uh, just south of it, much more modest because this is during the Great Depression. And even though they were a very affluent and successful family, it was still the Great Depression. So the house that stands there today is more modest than the larger plantation house that was once there. But this is Arcadia Homestead. People can tour the Simpson House. It is a um, historic house museum with modern day interpretive elements. So all the furniture is staged as it was since it was built in 1935. But we've added interpretive elements. You can see there's a panel there. We have a lot of buttons you can press and hear Coca-Cola advertisements from 1935 and things like that. So very multi-sensory experience. And then on the grounds, we have walking paths where you can walk around and learn about the original house that once stood there, the cabin that we've excavated, and learn more about the earlier times. And then we also have a victory garden um, that we work with the Milton Garden Club on. 
And it's hard to talk about all those wonderful things and then end on such a very sad note, um, but it is our sad reality that uh, that legislative funding that we were so fortunate to have since 2007 was vetoed two years ago. Um, we've worked really hard to maintain and try to sustain, um, but we have kind of come to a crossroads, unfortunately. So um, back in September, we cut our operations back to just two days a week rather than five days a week. So we're only open on Fridays and Saturdays now, um, which makes it very difficult to give school tours. We've had a couple schools that have been great and have worked with us to come over a month and a half just on Fridays. Um, so we are still trying to maintain and keep up what we can, but it has been a really devastating blow to our operations. So I'm in, there's been some press recently about this fact, and so we're working very hard with the university, with the historic trust, and also with the legislature to try and regain our footing so that we can get back to where we were. Um, and I did bring some of these brochures if anybody's interested in it. It's online. You can also ask me about it if you would like. But this is a, our sad reality right now. But we're going to keep chugging along until we figure out a solution. And I tell people all the time, even if you can't monetarily support us, just coming to our site. We're still counting our visitation. It's still important. We had over 15,000 people last year. Um, so we are still seeing decent visitation numbers even with the two days a week because so much of our facilities are outdoors and they're still accessible even if our museum's closed. So even if you can't monetarily help, coming to our site and just experiencing it, coming to our free programming, all of our programming's free, you get free admission, and tell somebody if you think it's cool and maybe they'll come and that's how we get the word out there. So I also, like I said, have information on the back about where we're located, and I would be happy to take any questions that you might have. Um, what are the, um, we had um, Ellen Co. Brody, and how does her family relate to, somehow she's related to the, this area. The Coes, or it might like have been on the mother's man. side. It might have been on the mother's side. If you, um, if you visit the homestead, Make sure to check out one of the back rooms. We uh, projected the family tree on the wall, and that family tree is huge. So the the Coes are related. Oh, it might be the mother, not the father. You know, Mr. Co might be Mrs. Co maiden name. It's it may be, and it's funny. I was on the phone with another descendant, Ellen Adair White. Ellen Adair, she's named directly from a, one of the Simpson like siblings' name is Ellen Adair, which I love that that's and her she name too. Atlanta? She's, what did you say? Does she live in Atlanta? She lives in Atlanta she and she's related to the Coes. She's from Miss Florida. Yes, mm -hmm. so that's her side. And I was on the phone the other day and she gave me this awesome history lesson and I should have brought that with me. It's hard to decipher the tree because there's so many different branches, but they are direct. Line. I think they had something to do. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What's that? Is that? What's that picture? Of? I just love this picture. <laughs> it, is, it has cool. nothing to do with Arcadia Mill. Um, this is a historic photograph. Um, I don't even know that we know where it is, but I love it because um, to show the perspective and the size. This is a cypress tree, and that's a smaller cypress tree for the time wow. period. Um, but these men are going to cut that down by hand. Wow. Um, and some of the the, um, <clears throat> the longleaf pine, um, some of them would be four men couldn't touch their fingers wrapping around. I mean, just wow. you would be amazed. Um, but yeah, I just love that photograph. <laughs> That's neat. All right. Any other questions? Any other questions? Well, thank All you right. so Thanks much. Thanks for having me.